Yeah. So if you look at the industry right now, some of the largest companies, when they buy the data centers or, and, and the servers in the data center, they actually only utilize on average a 10%. This means that all of this energy consumption of running these, running these vast amounts of servers uh, is for idle servers. And that's actually, that's what we're trying to change. So at Twitter, actually, we went from an app, this, this industry average of 10% to 40 or 50% over time. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we're trying to make we're trying to have an impact there as well. And especially for a very young company, four years old, you have already great customers yeah. like eBay, Airbnb, and Netflix. I mean, we talk about the the big platforms of North America. How did you get them as customers, being a startup? Yeah. So so for for us, there's there's two two types of customers. There are the customers that are paying customers, right? Um, and there are customers that are just using our software because our software is actually also offered as an open source technology. And uh, paying customers, we ha so we have a ton of companies that are using our software for free, and that's fine. Uh, but we also, like Uber is one of them, um, but we also have companies like Verizon Wireless, like NBC Universal, uh, even the Bundesagentur für Arbeit is actually using our software in order to uh, help them in their efforts of digital transformation and provide all this infrastructure that's necessary to build modern applications. And uh, the, the reason why these companies are working with us is because we're really the only alternative to the public clouds. Normally you use a public cloud when you want to build a new modern application. But again, that tends to be very expensive and you tend to be locked in. So if you look, for example, at Snapchat, when Snapchat filed to go public, when they uh, when they filed the S1 statement, uh, they had disclosed that they had many billions of dollars locked up in Google. And the market actually responded to that very unfavorably. And so they were essentially forced to do a similar agreement with Amazon Web Services, just so that they are not locked into Google. Mm -hmm. And would you say the key of success to getting those kinds of brands was a freemium model? Or did you really knock at the door at these organizations I mean, the security at eBay, I've been there a couple of times to talk to, uh, to the CEO, Mr. Wenig, and, and you go through a security. Uh, did you knock at the door to get in, or was it just a free model that said yes, yes? So, so actually, it's, it's mixed. So, of course, what helped was that we had this open source software, which really helped Twitter scale, and um, uh, on which we build our next product. Um, and. When we built the next product, we actually worked with some of our later stage investors like, like Microsoft and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And they helped us get into some of these larger accounts because they, of course... They have, have the connection. They have, yeah, they have the access. Yes. And so um, they would bring us into accounts um, such as Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. That's probably a company that nobody would think is a really... They, they have literally cruise ships, but they wanted to build an application. So. That their um, that their users on their sh or their the customers on their ships could be receiving better offers and that the customer service could increase and so actually one of the hardware manufacturers brought us into this account and said look this technology could really help in these companies with their digital transformation that means the role of your investors has been crucial for your success because they helped you to open the doors at big absolutely at at, at the big uh, accounts yeah. What I found very interesting, we had a chat last week on the telephone and uh, prepared that panel here, that there are over 50,000 well-educated Germans now in Silicon Valley. I was surprised about the numbers because my feeling was when I talked to Americans, they always have been very friendly to us uh, as broader media, but they haven't waited for us. I mean, there's great talent in, in America. Uh, you have influx from India, lots of software engineers yeah. with world-class education, which are now CEOs of Google or other companies, have an Indian background, uh, very well educated. It's um, more than 50,000. I was su surprised about the high number. What is the reason, if you talk to the Germans who live now in Silicon Valley, for their escape? Yeah, so, so I, think, I think that's multifaceted, but I think one reason is that in Silicon Valley, it's okay to fail. I think that mentality really exists there. And if you're thinking about doing a startup, I mean, a lot, you're going to have a lot of failures on, the, on, on your way. I mean, even, even some of the biggest success stories out there, right? 
you you look back and you think it's an overnight success, but it rarely is. I mean, it's a there's a lot of hard work. Things go wrong, and you gotta you fall on your face, and you have to get back up. And I think that's a that's a mentality that's much uh, that's much more natural in Silicon Valley. And I think people actually encourage you. If, if something bad happens, they encourage you to get up again and to continue going. And I think if you ask a lot of CEOs in Silicon Valley, they'll tell you one of the one of the most important things is to just not give up, because oftentimes you 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 face 50 problems in a day, and you're like ah. But it is, I just wanted to ask you that very seriously because we have invested into some companies and I always ask myself whether that is the biggest lie American companies are telling, CEOs are telling. Because if you look at the profiles of the CEOs we have worked with, yeah. we have invested is, if we see the company failing, they disappear. So, Or they work on boards as role advisor. Do you really know many entrepreneurs who started a company, failed? and then restart with serious funding like you did, isn't that just a, what can I say, marketing for Silicon Valley, but actually bullshit? So, well, I mean, uh, not, not, so I, one, one that comes to mind where that actually happened is Travis Kalanick, right? No matter what you think about him or, um, or, or not, uh, he actually had a bunch of failures before he came up with this idea of Red Swoosh, which was the previous company before him founding Uber. But uh, I actually think uh, there are a lot of companies that fail, and actually there's a there's a really good there's a really uh, interesting story when you I think it was in a Jack Welch book that I read about GE and one of the managers there um, who actually made a huge mistake and basically uh, that mistake cost the company 50 million dollars or so, and the guy thought oh, I'm going to get fired, so he had a uh, he had a um, a meeting with Jack Welch and uh, Jack Welch. Uh, he's like, I'm not going to get fired. And Jack Welch was like, No, that'd be really stupid. I just invested 50 million dollars into into you, <laughs> and you're not going to make that stupid mistake again, right? <laughs> so I, I think I think actually that's a I, th I think actually um, failure, unless you don't learn anything from it, is a good thing. And I think this this idea of taking risks is super important. We did that too in Mesosphere. I mean, like we um, we started with direct sales. And we, we have a direct sales model, and someone in the company had the idea, hey, let's start inside sales. And it was initially pretty, so inside sales meaning you have a bunch of people calling, calling on the phones trying to sell a product that actually doesn't really lend itself to be sold on the phone. And, um, well, uh, we, a bunch of us had the idea, well, a bunch of us had doubts that that was going to work, and uh, we still gave the person the opportunity to try it out, and um, it didn't work. But we learned a lot of things for the product of where the product should go in the future, and uh, yeah, that person also didn't get fired, of course, for it. Now that person is actually giving us a lot of feedback on what we what we need to improve in the product to maybe get it there. It didn't point. cost you 50 million. It didn't cost us 50 million. Yeah, you have to see. If, 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 always, if I hear the numbers from GE, I think that is the biggest advertising they did for employer branding. Yes. <laughs> I'm not so sure whether that is a reality sometimes, but, but anyway, I think your point is there is a good spirit if you fail, you yeah. can do it again. And from your perspective, it's not marketing, it's real in, in Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's really real. It's real. What makes a difference of being a Silicon Valley startup to, I mean, you have operations here in Germany, in Hamburg. If you compare the two ecosystems, what is the difference to the Silicon Valley? Uh, Stella. So, I think in in the U.S. you of course have much more access to capital. To I, th I think the number is like north of last year north of 50 billion dollars were invested into startups by the venture capitalists. And I think in Germany the number I read was like 1.9 billion. So it's a it's a there's a huge delta there. Um, that's one part, but I don't think that's everything. I think there's also We, we don't in Germany really have this ecosystem for M&A, and I think in the U.S. you actually you actually have this. Companies will buy smaller companies for the people, not necessarily for the product that they've built. This actually just happened to a couple of my friends. Uh, they they had a small company in it was called Skip Skip Flag. They did a seed round, and uh, it it was uh, what they had, they had a couple of customers. But now they were bought. I actually forgot who bought them. But one of the one of the big 
tech companies like Intuit or some, someone. And uh, that's actually the norm. I think that happens very, very often. You don't have in Germany companies like Allianz and so forth just buying smaller startups. But that's actually really necessary in order to get this uh, venture ecosystem bootstrap because if there are no returns, well, then you are not not so likely to go, to invest into into more startups. So I think that needs to change, and I think they actually politics could could do could could create some incentives to make it worthwhile. But is it really politics? If I look at the number of the companies today, and you compare, for example, TripAdvisor to Holiday Track, yeah, you compare the last numbers LinkedIn had to, had versus Zing. American companies, because you have one language market of 400 million, mm. if they scale, they have between, in general, five to eight times the revenue, and of course the profitability is eight to 12 times higher compared to American company to a German company because the market is much larger. Yeah. So isn't that really the politician question that can change, but we have to build larger organizations? Yeah, but I think- Which are more profitable? Yes, I think that's uh, that, that's certainly part of it. But I think I think also, uh, I mean, there's actually a really good video that everybody should watch. It's called "The Secret History of Silicon Valley," and it really uh, debunks a lot of the the uh, myths around how Silicon Valley was created. And if you actually go back in in history and look how how it got started, it got started by the military, right? Like by the mil the military created an ecosystem for companies to start uh, creating products that were sold to these. To, to, to the defense industry, and uh, I mean that's how that's how the first chip companies that started down in the San Jose area, uh, how they got started, and that's uh, I, th I think I mean I'm not advocating here for for more defense spending or anything, <laughs> so don't get me wrong, but um, I, I think I think you need you need an influx you of need, yeah you need an influx of capital and you need a, you need some way for this capital to turn into more capital right that's that's I think. The basis of getting such a such a uh, such a flywheel going, and I think that's what you have in Silicon Valley. And now, yeah, I mean, you have you have companies like Google and so forth, like buying up smaller companies to just get the talent in. And straight answer on a straight question: Yes or no, please. If you do your next startup, would you ever think do it in Germany? Um, yes or no? <laughs> yes. Why? So, uh, first of all, I, I really like Berlin. And okay, so I actually, it would be a Berlin I, question. I, I, also like, I also like Munich, but I think Berlin lends itself probably more for, um, for a startup. Um, I mean, uh, look, I've, I've lived in the US for a very long time, and at some point I've been thinking about maybe moving back to Germany. As, I, mean, I, I don't know yet, it's still open, it's still up in the open. But I think if, you, if, if I were building a consumer startup, you could probably build it in Germany as well. Um, I think you have much better access to talent in Germany. It's very hard to compete with companies like Google and Facebook that throw just tons of cash into uh, into the startups. Um, uh, sorry, into the engineer into the engineering that means workforce. So other, I mean, you could go to Los Angeles. There's Calvin. You have great universities there. You could go to to Boston. You have the MIT there. But that is for you not a not but, a real option. That would also be an option, I think. I mean, we, we actually looked at some other markets for uh, starting a development center. So we looked at Austin, Texas. I personally wouldn't want to live in Austin, Texas, but um, uh, <laughs> it's uh, pretty hot there. Yeah, but it, it's a nice it's a nice town and all of that. But uh, LA, I could imagine living. But I think you know, like I, I think if I if I look if I look forward like five or ten years, um, I, I could see myself moving back to Germany at some point, at least for. For some period of time. Okay, but uh, great to hear was uh, your success that uh, you think coming back to Germany and said something in Germany. Um, how can we, as a society, as companies, bring the Silicon Valley spirit to Germany? Do we really need tax reductions by the state to get much more capital into venture ca in, in the venture industry, venture funding? Is it that we have to build a real stand for two. What, what is what we can do to bring the Silicon Valley back to Germany? So, so I think it's not going to happen overnight. I think I think there are some. I mean, we're seeing Berlin really become kind of this epicenter in Europe for startups. I think that's going to continue. I think once we start seeing that some of the companies 
uh, that are kind of missing the boat right now on digital transformation. I think once they wake up and see, well, we've got to buy some talent, that could actually fuel a lot more growth here. And I think, I think that's, that's going to happen, right? I mean, I think digital disruption is real. I think we're seeing it in, in the taxi market and the hotel industry. I think there's so many more industries that are going to be impacted, especially as, um, as machine learning becomes more accessible. Uh, and I mean, today, right, you, a smaller startup is probably going to actually come up with better, better algorithms than a company, than, than a, than a, than a 200 year old com traditional company, right? So just to give you some figures about that, McKinsey uh, released two numbers uh, in 2017, the potential of digitalization, America probably 18% already achieved, 82 still to go. And they really tried to measure it, what the, the full potential is, not only the consumer market, but also in the B2B market, which is huge. Just if you think about farming, all these kind of yeah. industries, which have 1% digitalization today, that's huge growth. Europe, 10%, 90% to go. So from that perspective, there is a lot of growth uh, room here where we can go to. And that's another reason why I think uh, it might be great to do a startup here, because I think you don't face the same sort of fierce competition that you have in Silicon Valley today. I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot more opportunity. I think also in Germany you have the Mittelstand, right? And I think there's a lot of opportunity for B2B business to, to come and help all of these companies uh, achieve bigger growth and help them in their digital transformation. Okay, you, we just already um, talked about recruitment, how difficult that is in Silicon Valley. If you recruit people for your organization, both in Hamburg or San Francisco, for what kind of people, for what are you looking for? Who do you really want to should work for in your company? Are you, are you kind of... Uh, in general. As as so how, how do I interview them? or how do, or what For do what we, kind of people do you look? So what, what I think is the most important thing is uh, that people are really excited about the product that they're building, right? And they are, they're in it for the mission. So I think they're missionaries and they're mercenaries. And the mercenaries come in because they, they, you, you pay them money. And I think, uh, and, and they will just leave if they get another offer. So those are generally not the folks that we like to hire. We like to hire people who are really aligned with what we want to accomplish and this greater mission of really making technology super accessible. Though that, that's, that's a big part of it. And I think um, uh, then, of course, when it comes to, that, that's just a, a generically true for all of the positions that we're hiring for. If we're thinking about uh, engineering specifically, um, we're, we're looking for people who have maybe uh, some experience in open source tech, with open source technologies. Um, I mean, obviously, today, in, in, a, in a system where you have so much complexity, I don't know if you've ever been to GitHub, but there's a hundred thousand projects to choose from. I think you have you have to find people who are really willing to learn and relearn every day. I think there's there's not like the education of the past is not going to work today. You can't just learn a programming language and hope that this language is still relevant in 20 years. That's that's not. I mean, in our company, we have like nine different programming languages that are being used to build our product, right? And, and a lot of people need to at least know a couple of them. So. Uh, yeah, so we're looking to, for people who are really flexible and who are who are adaptable. I think adaptability and, and to change, and, yeah, to fast. yeah. I think that's that's actually one of the most important skills to have. Okay. Do you have a vision that you say I'm driving that company forward? That's my last question before I open the questions to you, so you can already think about what you want to ask. Do you have a vision if you look at your company in five to ten years' time? So what your company will be? Yeah. So one of the one of the things that we want to do is we want to really um, make clouds no longer lock you in. That's one of the things. But more importantly, we want to become uh, we want to become the driving force behind making compute or standardizing compute. Today, compute isn't very standardizable, right? You, you basically have different APIs on every cloud. Um, if, you, if you do genome sequencing, it, you don't know how long it takes, how much it costs. If you think about what has, has to happen for us to really advance personalized medicine, for example, you will have to have predictability. 
for how much a certain genome sequencing, for example, costs. If you want to cure cancer, uh, we, we have so much data today, we can figure out already which cancer medication, which cancer treatment works best. But for that, you need to, you need to have that person's DNA, you need to probably have a biopsy of the, of the type of can cancer, and then you can fight it much more effectively. And uh, in order to get that, we need to make access to these tools much easier, and we need to drive down the cost of what it costs to, to run these computations. And, and that's one of the areas where I want us to really be one of the leading and driving forces to get there. Fantastic. Thank you. Your questions. First question here. How do you handle internationalization, and where do you decide where to put up an office? So you have to you, did you understand the last round of the question? Handling internet, internationalization. Yeah, so great question. So um, we have an office in Hamburg, and that's, uh, that was picked because I knew someone in Hamburg who, who I trusted with kind of setting everything up. I didn't want to be the managing director because as you, as you know in Germany, when you're managing director, there's actually, there's actually, if you screw something up, you, you actually can go to jail if you're not in Germany and you're in the US. It's really hard to see what's going on. So um, uh, I think trust in a team and trust in the people, that's one of, that was one of the reasons why we started out in Hamburg. When, when it comes to now um, starting in new locations, the main reason we open offices is usually for sales. So we have in China, uh, we have in China an office in Beijing uh, because we have a bunch of customers in China. We have a small location in, in London and New York because, again, uh, financial services are really big in New York, so we have to have some representation there. Same for London. Seth Rim. There was a hand there far. Please. Uh, I, uh, I would like to ask something like, uh, so when you People are behind the ecosystem and mostly, mostly like, uh, so more than 40% of Forbes 500 companies, they are signed by immigrant immigrants. And this is one thing as an outsider, I'm from Pakistan, as an outsider, I came to Germany with an ambition to start a company. I still have that ambition, but I, I still have some years. But I, I personally felt that there is a certain uh, complicated bureaucracy uh, for an outsider, let's say, outsider to start a company in Germany. And if we still have, like I said, from Tom, uh, people who studied with me, those who start end up starting a business, they had at least one German co-founder. So this is still a mindset among us that to start at something in Germany, you need to have a German co-founder. And that, considering you work in Silicon Valley, how would you see Germany should adopt certain things, learn certain things from Silicon Valley to make this happen? Yeah, so we we had similar yeah we had similar issues when we started our our GmbH in Germany. So um, I mean, look in the in the US, you can do everything online. You you can you can start a company literally with a credit card online. And uh, when I when I deal with signatures, I can write an email. I have a I have a little button in my in my uh, PDF viewer that says play signature, and then I hit save, and then I send it back. In Germany, you have to, you have a, like wet signature. Fax is still a thing. I mean, I, 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 I it works. Uh, yeah. I don't know how to use it, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, to me, like th those th look. Uh, obviously, this is not the this is this is not the real reason why I think it's really hard. But there's a saying in the U.S. Death by a thousand paper cuts. I think in order to really, uh, I, I think in order to really uh, accelerate entrepreneurship, you have to actually remove as much friction as possible because it's hard enough to go out there and say, look, I'm going to quit my job where I'm going to get a safe payment in order to do something that has a, a, a pretty high likelihood of failure. And I think if you do that, like let's at least make sure none of none of these other things are are in the way. And uh, yeah. I mean, for us, we opened a bank account from the U.S. and Germany, and I had to go through the consulate three times. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to do. A big applause for Flora, please. Thank you. Thank you. You arrived at 2 o'clock after a 12 hours flight from San Francisco. Thank you very much for being here. And um, enjoy the further show. Thank you. Thank you so much.